Hello friends, my greetings to everyone. I am Seema, a head business analysis practices at Eisenbridge. Eisenbridge is key sponsor of Discuss Agile Network. So I welcome you all on this segment of uh, today's webinar series. Topic of today's session is how to promote Agile without being fired. Our guest speaker today, Tomas, he's a certified Scrum trainer and he's here to discuss seven habits of successful conversation. So over to you, Tomas. Oh, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, a rather good evening in New York, guys. I hope you get, uh, guys and ladies had a good supper by now. It's 4 p.m. here, so I haven't had a lunch, so it's your guys win basically in this moment. Um, so let's go and talk about uh, talk about how we speak with managers. So how do we get to talk with the, those people on the second side of the bridge usually or the fence. Um, but before we get there, um, just some background, some, some context on us. Uh, so uh, this is the picture from 2008 uh, when I was uh, on my first trip to India. Uh, that was Bangalore. Uh, in 2008, uh, my manager uh, came to me and said, uh, we have a project for you. And by that time, I was a agile project manager, whatever it means then. Uh, and he said, okay, we need you to coordinate the, the team which is in India and the US at the same time. Uh, I said, cool, can I see those people? Oh, no, no, because they are in India and, and, and US at the same time. Uh, so basically, knowing that there is no chance that we can, uh, you know, run a project remotely, uh, what we did uh, is, well, one day I packed, second day I got a visa, the third day I was in India uh, trying to run this project uh, together with the people in India uh, uh, locally. And we some, some, somehow succeed. However, what I noticed then and after this this uh, project and many other projects, many other conferences and, and events I've been to, is that uh, the discussion with the manager about you know how to be agile, how to run our work agile, it's kind of challenging, and uh, often you can find out that you end up uh, doing this well. Or the other thing is you can end up you know by being fired. The point is, which we have here, is that uh, what has Ken Schwebe said is that that Scrum Master is a user Scrum Master. So basically, you know, you know, the moment you are getting get fired, you're not much going to help your team anymore. Uh, so now the question is, one thing is that, okay, we want to convince people, and often there are those people are on the other side of the globe, so we have like 11 and a half hours of time difference, and we want to tell them, okay, this is not exactly how we want to work. This is not exactly what is effective. On the other hand, is we don't want really to be to be fired. So I'm working independently for the last six years, and every year I have a number of this kind of conversation, trying to trying to explain what is Scrum, what is not Scrum, what is Agile, and what is not. Uh, and I'm trying to make them more effective, so to be fired less often. I'm still getting fired. But what I came up with over the time is something I call seven steps for successful agile conversation. Um, the, the truth about those seven steps is that uh, they're not much steps, way more they are kind of habits. So something you need to get good at, but it's not about having one step after another. And after a second thought, I decided, okay, it's not just about the agile conversation. Uh, so, you know, having any kind of conversation, so for example, you're going to convince your wife or your husband for a new Ferrari uh, or whatever you want to buy next time, pretty, pretty much this uh, presentation could be useful for you as well as, as convincing your boss to go agile. Uh, because it's more about, okay, how do we tell people the things we know, how do we show our perspective? And at the end of the day, I also think that the seven is not the right number. So it's more like a, trying to group some of the ideas. So we're going to go through these ideas, starting from the very first one. And as you know, in IT, we start from the zero. Uh, so the very first number is uh, assume good intention. 
So we often hear the things that you should not assume anything when you when you go to work to, to someone else uh, or to some other place. <coughs> the thing is that uh, this is most important from all the steps we have in this in this presentation and the most difficult for me as well. Uh, so the idea is here, whenever you go for the conversation, you're going to have a conversation inside your office in India. You're going to have a conversation in, uh, with someone from the, coming to you from the US, Europe, or any country. Uh, first and foremost, start with assuming that the second side has a good intention. I mean, without this one, uh, we're not going to go far because uh, the moment you start thinking, okay, what kind of morons they are sending to us, what kind of ideas we have on the second side of the, of the, of the phone or on the second side of the table, uh, that's not going to lead you anywhere. So, so the moment you start uh, assuming that those guys are there to, to just to criticize what you are going to tell them, uh, you won't get much succeed. So the only thing you can do is tell, okay, I'm okay and you're okay, which means that your behavior comes from some good reason and my behavior comes from good reason. So if I want to achieve something, then there is some background be behind that. And also if, for example, some people be behave some way, there is a good reason that the system around those people, so the way we created this, uh, the teams, for example, is forcing those people to behave. Let me give you an example. Like, uh, so a classical situation in IT is that oh our developers don't speak with the with uh, QA right uh, how come oh because the QA are busy submitting the bugs okay how come oh because they are being uh, perceived on how many bugs they will submit in every day so now the structure we have created managerial structure we are looking at people on how many bugs they are submitting every day force QA rather to than focusing on good cooperation with the developers, they are more focused on how we can con how we can submit uh, so many bugs that we will be perceived as effective. And this is the system we create and it's not about that the people or the QA people or the dev people are bad in the system, it's just they behave the way we, we have created the system around them. So it's kind of, uh, kind of important to remember anytime you have a conversation with someone else, either in your office or outside your office, is that these are smart people and until they prove it that you're wrong, you need to come back to this idea of I'm okay, you're okay. And uh, the, the reason behind the behavior is usually the system around you. Okay, uh, step number one uh, is to prepare. Uh, I've seen few people going right, uh, you know, to this kind of, a, kind of a conversation like, uh, okay, let's talk about the, more, let's talk about the ad uh, but if you want to increase your uh, success rate, then definitely you need to spend a lot of time preparing. And by preparing, I'm not telling you about, uh, about uh, using, uh, I mean, f selecting the right suit or selecting the right tie, it's more about, uh, it's not about understanding who you're working, going to work with. Um, okay, so what does it mean in action, in, in, in fact? So we're going to have a conversation with someone and now the question is who is that someone, right? So often I hear, okay, I'm going to talk with the managerial team, I'm going to talk with the leaders, I'm going to talk with the customers. Well, there is no such thing like a customer. There's no such thing like a leader or customer. There's such thing like John, Peter, Stephen, and even if the managerial team at your organization is consisting of you know few people, then each of those people has a different goals, different needs, or different different. They want different things. So the on, the only reason they are sitting on the um, on the uh, meeting with you is not uh, because they, they are management team, but because they want to have their goals achieved by by this meeting. Uh, now, if you guys are doing 
uh, this kind of conversation remotely, then there is even more time to be prepared. I mean, we need to even to invest way more. Because the thing about having this conversation is not about how good we convince those guys, but it's about how good we are in building the trust between us and the second side. So, if you guys uh, are going to convince someone from the other, uh, other continent, then spend way more time just focusing on building the trust, building your credibility. That's very important for you guys. Now, um, so there are some questions you need to ask yourself about uh, what is going to happen on the meeting. And again, my suggestion is try to have this meeting face to face. If you're forced to have this kind of conversation uh, remotely, then make sure that you have any kind of video teleconferencing, not just the voice. I mean, to have something to sketch note so you can make a note together, so you can draw together based on the on the on the conversation. But do not go just with the voice over the over the phone. So the one kind of question, one group of question you're going to ask is. Who is going to be there? As I said, there, there is no such thing like a management team, but we're going to have a John, who has a CFO role, and we have a Chris, who is the CEO, and we have some CTO or some other leaders, and they're going to have a completely different perspective on the conversation we're going to have. So we need to ask a few questions. What is important for them? What is not important? What uh, problems do they have, what they are scary of. So one of the very important things to understand is uh, what are their current fears? What is, what is uh, the things that could make them run away from the change? So if you are coming to, you, to, the, to them and tell them, okay, we're going to this agile and it's going to destroy all your position and you're going to lose all your power, that's not the best way basically to make them you know, be happy about your concept, right? So you need to make sure what kind of uh, fears they have right now and what kind of fears they could be connected with this, this one together uh, later on during the change. Uh, the very good uh, good model for this one to understand uh, other people is a scarf model, and so this is like a S C A R F. We're not gonna cover this one. The C here, C. We're not gonna cover this one, uh, but certainly you can look for the scarf model. It's pretty good for understanding what people are afraid of and uh, what is kind of building the, the positive value for them as well uh, from the society perspective. Now, if you know people well uh, and you kind of have uh, already established a relationship with them, then moving motivators is another good way for understanding what is what motivates people and how the agile change is going to impact them. So that's pretty two, thing, two good things you can try with having a conversation. <coughs> Right. So we get this kind of question about those people. The other kind of question you're looking for, <coughs> sorry for that, is what else should I know? So, so for example, what kind of people are not going to be there? So if there is an IT manager who is not going to be for at this call, at this meeting for some good reason, and he might be able to change all the plans, all the agreements you have made with other managers. So make sure that you understand who, what kind of decision can be made by the people who are on, who are on this meeting, right? So can they do the decision to go agile, for example? Can can they make the decision for hiring the scrum master to your team? Can they make a decision for changing the structure of the organization or removing some of the policy that slows you down and uh, make your team ineffective? Um, if that's not your typical product, so you're not working with your your uh, typical product group, like for example, you're working in a, uh, outsourcing in the context of uh, you're doing the different project for different organization, then understanding their business, the technology is pretty important because the moment they start asking the question, okay, but how do we do this with embedded systems? How do we do this with uh, uh, systems that are very fragile or for example, we have a very lot of information we need to send uh, to the to the government or uh, that's a and that's a peacemaker for the for your heart and you know we need to, to create a lot of documentation so this agile no documentation idea is not the best idea uh, 
So you need to understand what kind of business they are in, what kind of technology uh, you are in. And by the way, someone is, I think, on the, on the, still on, not on mute, and I see, see, hear some background noise. So if anyone is, else is having the uh, voice on, then please uh, turn it down. Okay, now it's better. Thanks. Uh, okay, coming back to the concept. So, so understand what kind of business you're going to be in, uh, what kind of uh, challenges they can have with going agile with this business. Uh, and amazing thing about uh, about this is uh, trying to find any case studies from this business area. So the moment you have a conversation like this is not going to work in banks, then you have like three cases from the banks. It's not going to work for embedded, then you have some cases from the embedded, or it's not going to work for the hospital uh, software, then you have a, a specific cases from the hospital software where it did work. So you can use not just uh, yourself as a as a way of uh, convincing people but also use the use the other sources so you you show that is okay it do, has been tried before and it was working before uh, the other tool i'm usually using for this kind of conversation is i'm trying to understand uh, what kind of influence people that are going to be on this meeting with me have on the on the overall change so, because the thing is that on the meeting you can have like 20 people, especially if you have a strong hierarchical culture and like, like you know, plenty of manager coming to this meeting and there is no way you, will, you can satisfy all 20 people, right? So the thing you can think of is trying to imagine, okay, what kind of influence those people have on the organization, so how effective they are. And the second thing, second dimension is, what is their support for this change? Now, in this area, we have people who are very influential and they do, their, they do support this even strongly. So we, they do support the change strongly. So for example, this is a CEO. And the CEO name is Joel. And he's really happy about the change. So now he's going to be our supporter. But on this side, for example, we can have a CFO who is not very really happy about the change because it's going to impact the way they are used to do the planning. And that's Mark. And the thing is that we cannot just focus on Joe. We cannot just remember about making Joe happy, but we need to make sure that the, that the Mark is also somehow and somehow addressed. His concerns, his fears are somehow uh, taken care of because otherwise Mark is going to shut your idea down and there is no chance you're going to survive. There will be other people here and here and here. The thing is, the thing is that uh, you don't really need to take care of all those people. So people with the small influence, so people from this area are not critical for you so much. You need to make sure that they are that they are being heard. You need to make sure that the, their concerns are somehow addressed. But basically, the the area you need to focus is here. So you need to make sure that those people who have the biggest influence, no matter if they like the idea or don't like the idea, they have been heard and their concern has been addressed. Otherwise, it's not going to fly. So that was the preparation part. Now, uh, imagine that you are already on the on the event, right? So the thing is, uh, what I've seen is sometimes people come up in and come up to the meeting and they start selling address. So okay, this is what you're going to do. This is how it's going to do, going to happen. Now the very first thing is on this meeting, shut up and listen. Those guys have their own problems, and you are supposed not to sell agile, but to solve their problems. So instead of telling them what they're supposed to do try listening to what kind of challenges they have right now. Try to understand what kind of problems they have now. To do this well, then you need to ask a question. Okay, what do you mean by that? What concerns do you have? What other problems do you have? Uh, now, the other thing is that you can have a situation when you have like five people and there's just one person speaking. So the CEO is a loud person and is taking all the time. So make sure that you ask the question to all, every participant, not just the loudest person. The thing that someone is not speaking doesn't mean that he doesn't have an opinion about the change you're going to run. So 
make sure that you have heard everyone and also make sure that you have you are observing what is happening. So, for example, you said something or, for example, CEO said something and uh, there is CTO who just shut up or he leaned back so he doesn't feel secure with this statement he just, he, he just heard, right? So make sure that you are seeing what is not being told, what kind of conflict they have. If there are two people with having a strong conflict between them, like you have two leaders and they have two different opinions, make sure that you notice this one because it's going to impact your change for sure. Um, so, basically, uh, the moment we have the moment we have went through the to the to the conversation, so we listen what kind of problems they have. Uh, again, we don't start telling them how we're going to solve the problems. We're going to make sure that we understand what they said. So the very best way to do this is reflect. So telling exactly what they thought, what they said. It's not just using the same words. It's about re re uh, paraphrasing. So rephrasing. So did I understand you correctly that you said this? Did I understand? that your biggest problem is that. Uh, do you guys say that it's really hard for you to run the big projects? Or do you guys say that you have one team that cannot communicate with the customer? Uh, do you guys think that you can't uh, estimate your product correctly? Do you guys uh, consider looking for another team because you are thinking you'll go too slow? This kind of question you need to ask. One thing is that you're going to make sure that you understand, so you really understand what they said. The second thing is that you're going to make sure that they know you have understand. So instead of selling you agile, selling them agile, you're going to solve the problem. Now, if they confirm that you what you have said is what kind of problems they're going to they, they, they're trying to solve, the next point is proposing solution. Again, we don't sell agile, right? We are not looking to tell them, okay, this is uh, this is the magic bullet that is going to solve all the problems, right? We're going to propose. We're going to tell them what kind of ideas. So one thing we're starting with is basically discuss discussing potential root causes. So let's come back to this thing that we that we had a situation there. Okay, that our team cannot estimate, right? Oh, uh, really? So, what could be the reason for this that the team cannot estimate? Or maybe because we are changing uh, the team structure every few days and, and we cannot establish the stable team, which means that people don't know each other, they then don't know how fast they can work as a team. Uh, or maybe we are asking them to multitask and pushing some additional work on them, so they think that they can do more, but then they find out that there is plenty of things they, they need to do. Or maybe the other reason for that is that people are very, very willing to work, but they cannot get an answer from the customer, so they have no idea how to deliver. And they learn a few days later that they have delivered not what the customer was looking for. So try to show them different potential root causes, and also try to show them the options. So what kind of options you guys have? Uh, what kind of uh, what kind of solution we can try? Again, Agile is not silver bullet, so we're not going to solve all the problems. The thing we're going to do, we're going to do run the experiments. And the experiments has always a good side and a bad side. So, there's not just a green field, uh, you know, after we go Agile, there are going to be a lot of consequences. People might feel insecure with the change. Uh, People might think that they have lost their control over what is happening, right? So, present both benefits and the cost of the change. What kind of situation uh, can be in like week, month, a year from now after we went there, right? So, what kind of cost you're going to have? So, not just focus on the benefit, not just show this like uh, imaginary kingdom when everything is going to be perfect. I mean other projects to the fail, right? So what kind of problems we're going to have? And finally, make sure that you get a feedback from them. So not just tell them what you said and, and go forward. Make sure that you hear back from them what they think about what you said. So make sure that uh, 
if you say, okay, this is good, this could be a potential problem. So, so we talk about this estimating again, and this could be a potential problem. So, ask them what you guys think. Which one of these uh, could be in your case? Which is most likely for you guys? The great thing about agile, and it's really important when we when we talk about the value of going agile, is that we are addressing three kinds of perspective, and most of the the biggest problem we have in the organization are in three areas. One is the social area. So, for example, we have people not talking to each other. We, pe we have people who hate their job. We have people who are fighting, who don't know how to communicate well, uh, who has a problem with understanding each other, who has a problem working effectively as a team. And the good thing is that, you know, we address those things. We build the teams, we build the stable teams, we try to build trust into that teams, we try to build a relationship between the product owner and the, and the team. We have a scrum master who is going to help the team be effective. So we are addressing the social area. Other people, Let's focus on the social aspect of the of uh, business, but they do focus much about the dollars or the business side. So, are we going to earn money on this project? Are we going to be effective? And again, giving you a short feedback loop uh, from Scrum, giving you an option to discover product with the customer, giving you a uh, continuous improvement of the backlog giving you the conversation with the, with the stakeholders, with the real users. So, focusing more on building the right thing rather than building what is broken down in the documentation someone sent to us is again improving the business. So, we also address the needs of those people who are focused on the business. And the third dimension or the third perspective people have is a technology. And again, those, those are usually tech savvy people who are saying, okay, we have a crappy code, we have a low quality product, and by having the definition of done which make you deliver working product every iteration, but letting the people, the team decide what kind of solution they can do instead of forcing that solution on them, by having the team think about, okay, what kind of what kind of uh, way, how we can solve some specific problem on technical side so we don't impact the other areas of the products. We also can improve the technical side of the, of the product. And this is, uh, I think, the great thing about the Agile and, and, and all, this, uh, all these things we try to do in the, in the IT right now, in the, in the product development, is that we address all those three perspectives. So we address social, we address the business, but we also address the technical side. So, uh, so we get a proposal, we send them proposal, or we show them proposal, uh, but usually it should not be just you talking, them listening, but you should think about how I can involve people in having this kind of conversation. So, you get the three examples here. This is uh, the very first one here is how do I usually make a note? So even if I listen to the customer telling the, telling me, okay, what kind of problems they have, I do draw a structure of the team, uh, I do make a note, so they can say, no, 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 it's not exactly what I meant, it's, it's, it's rather we're doing it differently. So what you can hear is the structure of the organization uh, one of the customer had, and the moment you start writing names, so for example, oh, this is this is Jacob, and he's a project manager. It makes it more clear and visible for you guys uh, what kind of problems there could be in an organization. The moment you have, you're talking about the resources, that's kind of easy to assign a half of the resources into one, one team and half of the resources into second team. But the, the moment you say, okay, I have one, half of the person in one team, half of the person of the, in the second team, then you, the very next question is, Okay, which part of the square person? Is it bottom or the top of? Is it left or right? So the moment you start talking about the people, not about the resources, it's way more understandable what is happening in the organization, especially if you have situation when you're supposed to work in 10, 10 projects of, or something like that. Here, 
Uh, we have another example when we get some of the conversation about the potential root causes on the left side, and then we have a conversation about okay how we can solve this problem again. So so we do the visualization. We ask the people to to come up with the idea. We try to to write them down. Uh, team on the left side here is trying to decide if they want to go as a one team. So they used to work like three separate teams, and each of these teams were like one or two people, and that was kind of ineffective. And they say, okay, how about we try doing something differently? So on the left side, here you have a pluses of having one, one team, and here are the kind of, what kind of problems we can have with the. With. So they basically need like a half an hour to make a decision themselves, rather than having the decision, you know, push on them uh, on how how they going how they going to work. And they decide that they want to go with one team, so it's, which solves a lot of the problem they had. The guy here again. Uh, this is one of the owner of the company who is having a conversation about okay what kind of problems we have why the quality is low why we are uh, why we don't have a time to improve the quality so, so that's uh, that's uh, uh, we're looking at the dependencies between the uh, between the different different components of the organization and what is impacting what so have the have people involved into this kind of conversation rather than you just telling them what you need to do. There are a few things to remember about about uh, this kind of conversation is that first of all there will never be a perfect time to run your pilot. I mean I've seen the companies telling oh no no we cannot do this pilot this quarter we cannot run pilot right now no no we'll do this next next month we'll do this uh, half a year from now and I rarely see them coming back to me and say okay we are ready to start uh, pilot. There is always a good reason not to go. So if you decide you want to go, don't spend another half a year for preparation, just do it. Take the best project you can have to do the best thing you can, you can have right now and just do it. The other thing you need to remember is that because you there is so much managerial focus on the pilots, especially other pilots. So, so you get all you need when you do run a pilot. You have uh, everyone on that uh, from the management team involved in running the pilot. That the pilots are always successful. So that's pretty good because you can build a scrum credibility after the pilot. So you can say, okay, that's successful. But the other thing is that you need to remember that after the pilot there will be a normal pro normal projects or normal teams working on not the pilot teams. And their life will be more difficult. So remember this one after not to fall into you know huge energy situation like oh we thought that everything would be perfect after the pilot. No, usually it's not. Usually we have a lot of problems after right after the pilot. Uh, the other thing is that the moment you start changing the organization, you find that there is a huge amount of things you need to change. And there is no way you're going to address everything. So build a backlog of the impediments you have in the organization. Define the team. My recommendation is to have it on the team and managers who can influence the organization. So having someone from the bottom of the organization is usually not going to work because they don't have enough influence. Probably having someone as a product owner uh, maybe the CEO of the organization is a good idea and also having an external coach if this is your first time you're doing the change is also a great idea. If you have already some, some other coaches in your organization then having having them work for the as a scrum master for this uh, impediment removal team is pretty good good concept. Uh, the, other, the other good thing to remember is just something I call standing on two legs. So another thing I noticed with the with the transformation is that we go with the we start the transformation and we find a we find a manager who is really supportive for this transformation and the other coach is working mostly with this manager because this manager is really supportive for this transformation. So it's really nice to talk with this manager. He's a smart guy and he tells that yeah we're doing right things and he's solving our problem and everything is perfect. Till the moment he till the guy is being promoted, fired, moved to another department or anything else. The moment he is gone from our organization is the moment we find out that there is no one else to support our change. And the ch change is gone with this manager as well. So the smart uh, agile coaches are standing on two legs, which means they have at least two people in the organization who are supporting the change. 
So make sure you are not working just with the guy who is the, your the, the one you favorite, so 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 the one you like most. Make sure that you have at least two people in the organization you can go to and talk about the problems because the moment the one is gone, the second will be still there. Last but not least, remember that we're going to we're going to make mistakes. There is no right way of doing the other transformation. However, there are sometimes better ways of doing it and sometimes worse. The thing is that you're going to make mistakes, the thing you're going to fail, and the thing is that you should are supposed to learn on that. The moment you do it, you're getting effective. The moment you stop doing, then you're going to have some pro huge problems. So make sure that you iterate on what you do. Now, uh, almost last point uh, is we had this conversation. We managed to get a buy-in from the from the organization. We managed to to get support from from management, and then we say, well, "Hey, hooray! We managed to do it." And we find out that the week later, no one is so much supporting us. To avoid this, is we need to repeat. We need to first of all repeat message. Message. So educate, 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 and educate, and then educate. So. The fact that you have taught this once doesn't mean that the people will remember this next day. So you need to make sure that everyone has heard the message many times. And you can educate yourself, you can send them the links, you can share some video, you can ask some external expert to join you for the, for the, for the presentation, or maybe just ask a friend from you, of you from the next company, the next door, to come up and, and tell how they do it. So when I work on the local markets, like outside Poland, uh, I usually try to find someone local as well, so 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 he can come to the to the organization I'm I'm, I'm working with, and then okay, yeah, it's possible to do this in in this country. It's possible to do this in in this uh, in this business. Uh, the thing I already said is the run the experiments. I mean, uh, if you don't fail, then most likely you're not experimenting, you're still in the, your comfort zone, you're not leaving this one, which basically means that uh, you're not doing this efficiently. The moment you don't feel secure, the, the moment you don't feel comfortable with the change you're running, then is the moment you experiment. So one of the good quotes I heard recently is that find out what is your comfort zone and then go two steps forward. So leave your comfort zone to, to be able to run the experiments. Last but not least is improve continuously, which means that the good change, the effective change, is not going to happen if you just run one pilot. So if you just mobilize yourself or your organization for a week or a month and then let it go again, you're going to fall into the same, same problems you had uh, previously. And I've seen many organizations running a successful pilot and then going back to their previous behavior. So the thing you can, the only thing you can do is improve continuously, which means day after day after day. So having a, you know, improvement weeks once per quarter is not going to change anything. Having an improvement day every day, yep, that can help. Okay. Uh, we're coming to the we're coming to the conclusion. We're coming to the end, and just wanna just wanna make a list again. Uh, first and foremost, this is the most important for me. Assume good intention. Make sure that the people you're going to talk with are the good people. Uh, then the next point is prepare prepare well, especially if uh, if someone you're working with is remote from you. So especially if you guys are working with people from the US, from Europe, from Canada and other country, there will be a huge barrier and you need to spend even more time for, for all, doing the preparation. So make sure that it's done well. All right. Um, now, next point is spend a lot of time listening to people and asking the question. So make sure that you hear what they are talking, telling and make sure that you also hear what they are not telling. Make sure you spend a lot of, lot of, uh, part, huge part of your meeting just listening to what they are saying. 
then reflect on what they told you. So show them that you understand and make sure that, uh, that you get it right. So you're not going to solve the other people's problem, but you're going to solve the problem of the people you are sitting with. Propose the solution, but don't force on them. Give them the options. Give them the ideas what you think that might be working. Make sure that they feel comfortable with the change. Involve them into this discussion. Make sure that they are engaged. Make sure that it's not something that's being given to them, but it's something they have created together with you. Have a conversation, not a monologue with those guys. Finally, repeat the message. And you know what? If you find out yourself being still, still being fired after doing all of this, then there is a great quote for you, which uh, was said by Winston Churchill that, you know, if you have enemies, then great, because you have something to fight for, and sometimes being fired is all we need. Uh, and yeah, I had few situations when I did fire my customer because I said, okay, this just doesn't make sense for you guys. You are supposed to stay the way you are, and you will be happy where you are, or you will be unhappy where you are. But that does not going to work with what I want to do with you guys because I'm not going to help you. Uh, good. We're done with the we're done with the presentation. Um, one of the things is that I'm going to be I'm going to travel to India. Uh, August this year, so there was a hope we'll be able to see each other uh, during the courses, or maybe we organize something around the courses. We're going to find out soon. So keep uh, keep focus on what is happening on the uh, Eisen Bridge, and make sure that you follow what they're telling you because we're going to we might be able to see each other in August, which is pretty hot in India as far as I remember. Um, we have some for some time for the Q and A, so I would be happy to answer if you have any. Yes, uh, I yes, know Thomas. I'm okay. signing questions one by one to you, and I have signed one first question uh, also. Okay, I'm, I need to figure out how to how to see the question. All right, do we have any document template to ask question to the team and record the responses? Um, that's a, that's a pretty good question. Um, I don't have a template uh, because uh, my question really run depending on the answer I get. Uh, usually, the one thing one thing you need to remember is try to keep as open question as you can. So the difference between the open and the and the closed question is basically the the closed question is. Is, let me go here. Can I do it? Yeah, I can. Okay. So, so open. Um, oh, does it work? Open question is something you ask like who, why, how, and close question is something you have an answer yes no for that. And the class question basically is not, it's not going to give you a lot of information. It's just going to get a very short response. I usually, what I usually also do is I'm trying to, I'm trying to collect those information, write them on the paper, but I'm trying to use the big letters so they make make sure that they vis see what I'm what I'm writing down. The other great thing is you can do is write down on the table, on the on the board, or on a flip chart paper so they see what you're writing down. Hope that answered the question. And the approach to so solve social problems. Another question from uh, Sunil. Oh, that's even more tough than the than the than the previous one. Um, so again, the social problems are usually coming up with the uh, from the different perspective of uh, people in the team and the different goals. So what I would usually do when I have a social problems is basically find out the what kind of what part of system we have uh, that is causing this kind of problems. Uh, to give you ex um, the, the great example was when we, when we had a QA and the, and the devs, right? So it's not that we have a social con problem in the context that they don't like each other. The thing is that they had the different goals, and the developers, for example, are forced to deliver as much code as we can, 
uh, as they are supposed to, or, or more than they can, right? So, so imagine that uh, we're spending, you know, asking the people to deliver like 10 features and they can realistically do the six feature only. So they're going to reduce the quality. And it's going to impact the QA because they're going to spend more time just to trying to make their environment working. So basically uh, the social problem that we're going to have is that we're going to, you know, complain about the second team and the second team is going to complain about the first team. And that's not going to lead to any solution. Uh, if I have a if I have a, this kind of conversation, uh, I can do two things. If the conflict is not a huge, so we're not st still not going to kill each other, then I'm going to put everyone in one into one room and show them different perspective and try to solve the problem together. Uh, also, it may be useful to get some manager to to this conversation. Uh, if we I have more like a personal problem, so two people with different perspective, I would may probably have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with each of them and try to uh, find a solution. Again, a solution means experiment we're going to run together. Uh, and I'm not going to work, certainly I'm not going to be a court. So don't be like uh, someone who is going to solve the problems. Don't be like someone who is going to make the decision. They are supposed to make the, solve the problems. The thing you can do as a scrum master or other coach is to have an effective facilitation of the discussion. Hi, Tom is going to ask for this question. We can go forward, which is uh, how to deal with situation where people think other Scrum is tracking the time on our basis because it's burned or just oh crap. Oh, yeah, I yeah, uh, that's guys from uh, Swat Swati. I hope that you didn't misspell your name. That's a crap we often you often see. Um, the thing is that this all sometimes uh, well it's often used this way, and we also had a plenty of but uh, electronic tools that are being used this way. This is why I hate basically having any electronic tools. Uh, so one of the one of the reasons uh, for for that is that uh, the people are being tracked this way. So we have a situation when the manager don't have a transparency into the into the into what is happening on the team level, and they're trying to push this kind of tool. So the very first thing I would try is instead of convincing people that they are not being tracked or being controlled, is to make sure that the management do not have a need for this kind of control. So I would, for example, go with the physical task board. If you have a team, if you have collocated team, just put a, the whole task board on the side, get rid of any tools that are supposed to uh, supposed to track them down, and if they hate burn down chart, just remove it for a while. After a few sprints, they will figure out they don't know how good they are doing and if they are going to finish the sprint or not. So the moment they figure out, oh, maybe we need to have some tool about knowing how fast we go, and you can say, oh, by the way, there is a bar that child that work pretty well this way. So I would start with the management here, uh, then I will remove every tool that is uh, potentially causing this feeling, so help them, help them get rid of this tool. Probably, again, probably physical board will be better, and then after that I would work with people, you know, explaining those guys that uh, you're not supposed to be tracked, you're supposed to track yourself. How that helps. Okay, going forward, um, how to handle teams, uh, QA, Dev, UX, without bending on one side, how to balance this out? Um, not quite sure if I understand this question. It's about, uh, uh, it's about uh, the team uh, uh, structure or it's about uh, something else? Uh, so so, so, Sajuta, can you can you elaborate a little more on that? Do we do we have an option to for, uh, to get us some more some more elaboration on that? Uh, Tomas, uh, I have assigned yeah. all the questions uh, which are posted here. I request you all if you have any other query, please post here. Sujata, can can you uh, describe your question? The question is. Um, as a manager, without bending on dev side or QA side or UX side, how to satisfy all the team members' uh, like questions, queries, or 
complaints, everything. Like if we are bending towards one team, the other team will be dissatisfied. So how to handle those situations, like how to maintain balance among everybody? All right, now, now, I see, now I see the concept. So again, uh, this is something I already mentioned earlier. You're not supposed to be a judge. You're not supposed, uh, and can you guys, oh yeah, thanks, going mute. Uh, so you're not supposed to be a, a sol pro solving all the problems from the, uh, from the team. Uh, the thing is, the moment the moment you have a QA dev and a UX, the moment you're not not building uh, cross-functional teams. So one of the things I would solve that would solve this problem is saying, okay, guys, UX, dev, and QA together are supposed to solve the problems. So you guys uh, sit together and let me know how you're going to solve this problem together. So because it's not about how fast we do the code, how fast we do the testing, how great we are creating UX, because uh, it is about uh, how fast we can deliver product, working product which has both UX uh, and software, I mean the development, and it has been tested, right? Uh, and so, so the moment you remove yourself from the, from the, uh, from the judge role, the moment you can be someone who helps the team, uh, and the team will stop coming to you, solving the problems. Um, I'm going to give you a good examples I'm using. So the moment I have two daughters, one is 10 and one is 11, and the moment they are starting, starting a fight with, between each other, I just tell, don't, don't uh, hurt my daughter, right? And they both look at me and they, you know, there is no way for me to say, okay, this the fault is on one side or on the other side, right? The only thing is that you're not supposed to hurt my daughter, and you're supposed to solve the problem together. And I think that's that worked pretty well for the team. Just tell, okay, you guys are supposed to deliver software. Figure out how you're going to do it. <laughs> hope, uh, hope that's going to hope that's going to uh, uh, to answer this question. Yeah, oh, we have please. more question, which is which is great. Um, how to measure team productivity and the river, the rife of velocity without using tools and barn house. So again, uh, velocity uh, is something the team is supposed to use for knowing how much they can plan the next sprint. And the moment you start uh, evaluating your team based on the velocity, is the moment they they will inflate either the story points or they will reduce the quality. That just happened. Every team I've seen where they said had a had the goal of in, in improving the velocity it just happened. I mean, we go down with the quality or we just uh, have a bigger user stories. I mean, uh, it used to be five story points. Now it's we have thirteen. So uh, story points are not to measure your team. It's about the team to know how much they can do, and again, if you have a f if you have a situation when people being fed about being measured, I would rather get rid of the measurement at all, build a trust, and then come back to the to the measurement again for the team or for the product owner. So the product owner know how much the team can deliver in five sprints rather than in one sprint. But if you don't have a if you have a fear in the team, then Basically, all the metrics are going just to drive you drive you down with the with the quality, or just going to be faked. I mean, we're really good at making the data and making the fake data. I've seen this happening so much times, so many times that it's more about let's build the team that will trust each other than you know de getting the data that's not reliable. Uh, what what does the scarf stand for? So these are like uh, five social uh, social uh, let's call it uh, dimension, uh, and I hope I will remember them correctly. Uh, um, scarf, and I'm not sure. CS for certainty. A is autonomy. Uh, R is relatedness. Uh, 
F is furnace and S is status. Oh, now I remember. So it's more about it's more about uh, social aspect. The thing is that uh, what the neuroscientists find out is that the social aspect is as important as uh, just a surviving aspect. So it's a social needs are very basic needs, and you react to so your manager telling telling you, let me give you a feedback, especially that's a mid-year feedback uh, review. So you react the very way, the same way uh, for let me give you the feedback as uh, for encountering a tiger in the wood. So your brain reaction is the very same way. So, so you have a, just a few reactions. So it's very important to understand what people do fear because the social reaction will be very strong. Or we lost the status, for example. So you're not going to be a manager anymore because we have agile. That's a fierce, fear reaction for the status. And it's very important to address this before we go forward with any change. Do we have any other questions? Uh, Thomas, we are about to reach the time box and uh, no other questions is there. So uh, I thank you for the great insight for the seven habits of successful conversation. And I also thank for the participation by all the friends who are here. Thanks very much, you guys, guys, for finding time, especially in the evening, for, for, having, for joining us. So, so I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for joining all. Bye.